great. Hi, everybody. This is Joanne with Read Science, and I am joined by my co-host, Jeff. And welcome. Glad to see you again, Jeff. We just saw each other last week. He came into town and we had lunch together like twice in, in, in eight person. years we've met each other, you know, <laughs> in person. So anyway, and our guest today is Lucy Jane Santos, and she has written a book. Now I'm holding up the U.S. version. I have seen a picture of the U.K. version. It's very different. But her book, you've got it. Ooh. Wow. Very different. So this is uh, Half Lives, The Unlikely History of Radium, and uh, packed full of information about radium. Some you may or may not know. So we're going to talk to her about that. Uh, yeah. So why don't I read Lucy's bio and so you know a little bit about her. Lucy Jane Santos is an expert in the history of 20th century health and beauty with a particular interest, and some might say obsession, in the cultural history of radioactivity. She is now the executive secretary of the British Society for the History of Science. That's cool. <laughs> in the past, she has also worked as the director of the Crime Writers Association and for the Gourmet Society, where she was editor, and at the International Wine and Food Society. Wow, uh, you've done a lot. <laughs> I like societies. <laughs> <laughs> She's a member of high society. <laughs> okay. Well, we're so glad you could be here today. Thanks. And the, you're sitting. Uh, you're sitting in the UK right now. Obviously, I think if you're the, uh, if you yeah, are I'm, the executive secretary for the British Society for the History yeah. of Science, you're probably in Britain. I'm a couple of hours outside of London on the east coast here. Nice. nice. All right. Well, Jeff, why do you have a question to begin? I do. I do. Um, and the the thing that we almost never do, Lucia, with with our guests is say, how did you come to write this book? And I'm, I'm going to violate that a little bit because the, the subtitle, The Unlikely History of Radium, is that radium does have a rather unlikely history. And it's it's a very interesting scientific story. <clears throat> but I wanted to let people know right off that you've given us a much richer story than just the science and the scientists, but a cultural understanding as well. The discovery of radioactivity and radium near the beginning of the 20th century collided in maybe a unique way with, with a culture of modernity and fashions in society that might be unique in history. And so we don't often do those origin stories, but could you recount for us some of what you you mentioned and described in the epilogue briefly about uh, what you thought you were researching and writing when you started the project and how it unexpectedly ended up with, with this fascinating book instead? Yeah, well, um, I actually love the question about how I found out because it is how I started this project because it is ultimately the entire book is about it. and. It's this. So yes. I, I like to go mm -hmm. straight in with showing a um, showing something from my collection. So this is a box of face powder, um, mm -hmm. and I bought it um, from an auction house. And I bought a big box of cosmetics, lipsticks, and all sorts of things. And um, in it, in that big box, was this. And I thought it was just a really lovely uh, powder box. I mean, it's really gorgeous. It's uh, silver, it's black, it's quite art deco-y, which is something else that I love. Um, and it all was lovely until I flipped it over and on the back of it, it says, made with radium. <laughs> um, and is that still on there? <laughs> actually, I've got it, I've, I'm lying a little bit because this is a different box. It looks exactly the same, but it's not the radium one because the radium one is leaking powder and I'm a bit scared of it. <laughs> you need a lead box. <laughs> so yeah, it is in a box in my cupboard. But for prop purposes, this is exactly the same. Um, so that really led me to the question of what what's happening here because I hadn't and I knew that people used arsenic and lead and mercury in makeup because my uh, my background is history of makeup. I love history of makeup, um, but I'd never heard of radium, and that just sent me on this spiral um, journey of of what this product was, and then it just led on to lots of other stuff. And I soon found out that all of the books about radium 
barely mentions uh, makeup products. There's a few that just sort of uh, mentions it in passing. It's maybe like a fad or something a bit bizarre that people were doing. But as I researched more and more, I just found hundreds of these products and I realized that it couldn't just be a temporary fad. Mm -hmm. It couldn't just be a few people uh, going, oh, let's make some money out of this. It had to be something else. Um, and then that led me to a uh, very strange places actually. <laughs> Can you can you give us an idea of the scope for, for people who haven't read the book yet, even though I have, and, and it is amazing, the scope of the radium craze, and I, I societies go through crazes, and I guess we we didn't have another one like it until maybe the the Sputnik craze or the you know the orbiting the earth craze or something. Yeah. But radium was on everybody's lips. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, this, the book um, ends up being slightly them them thematic, but also chronological. But when I first started writing it, I actually envisaged it as a, as a, a journey down a street. Mm -hmm. And with the idea that pretty much any shop that you went into, any building along a high street in a, in a typical British town, you could encounter radium in some way. So you could it could be in the doctors or it could be in the theatre or the pharmacy or um, the beauty salon. Um, so it's it, that's the thing that I kept thinking about as I was writing about, that you could encounter it in any shop that you went into, large or small. You would People would be talking about it. People would be referring. Um, so the word radium comes to become a characteristic. So it's sort of playing on the idea of radioactivity as being something fast moving and zippy. So the, you could call someone to be like radium and that would kind of mean that they were a bit enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, things like that. And I just, it, yeah, like you said, it, until the sort of space craze, there's nothing really that really sort of comes down to the fashion, to the makeup as, as much as radioactivity does. I mean, even X-rays slightly before Yes, but radium even more so. And it was really a story that I didn't, I felt that hadn't really been explored. Obviously, historians of science and historians of medicine are much more keen on focusing on the hospitals or the, the mm -hmm. labs um, and the, the normal day to day activities of our grandparents or great grandparents don't really feed into those stories. And that's what I was trying to do with this book. Right. And you've, you've drawn in so many so many threads of the thing. It's like there was the, the discovery of x-rays, how you could see bones, and people started thinking about medical applications. People were alert to scientific developments, to new things. Modernity was an idea. Anything new, like sliced bread, which came later, you know, was <laughs> sterile food preparations because food adulteration was a huge, huge problem. That Just so many things, plus... Not least, perhaps, the the incredible, I don't know, stature, the romantic vision of, of Marie Sklodowska Curie and, you know, her struggle to produce this thing, to show that it was a new element, uh, that it was such an exceedingly rare thing. This just hit all the, the buttons, didn't it, for, for all the things people were excited about at the time? Yeah, absolutely. Radium... Radium is everything. It's um, <laughs> it just <laughs> one of the things about having a substance that people don't really understand, is striving to to understand, striving to learn about, is you can pretty much fit it into any box that you want to. Um, and right. radium and radioactivity are, are quite versatile substances, or in any case, aren't they? Um, so, and especially when you don't really have an explanation for them. So it's sort of, you can then start mm -hmm. feeding into ideas of spirituality and seances and all sorts of things. And radium just sort of edges in and, and, and uh, permeates everything. And obviously that's a characteristic of it anyway, but in culture as well, it just, yeah, yeah. It just gets in there. There was yeah, a time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because there was a time when it seemed like it could it could solve any problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and especially, I mean, the thing that I keep coming back to in the book is that because it was when I mean, although I say that I talk, although I do talk more about the cultural and social aspect of it, it does obviously keep coming back to the science and the medicine. Mm -hmm. And really I 
really it's this idea that radium could be used to cure cancer and the whole other very serious illnesses and it's the hope and it's the expectations um, of people that it could do that that really um, helps drive it into all those other nooks and crannies of history because there is just this this expectation that it is a miracle substance that it is going to cure everything and that really um you know it does drive entrepreneurs it does drive the scientists it does drive the the doctors as well um but yeah so i mean everything really comes down to that so i, I start the story i mean i do start the story back when uh before Marie Curie gets involved right. we start looking at pitch blend the substance that radium is extracted from um so i talk about that but then i also start bringing in the excitement from around about 1903 1904 when people are starting to say right well this is this is curing cancer and there's a there's a man in new york william morton dr morton and he says by 1904 i have cured three people of cancer mm -hmm. and this is a huge story for the press i mean there is so much hope and expectation and the fun thing about that is that very soon after that that starts spiraling into entertainment because people love the idea of being able to cure cancer but also the idea of radium then oh, there's this wonderful story which i do talk about in the book which is something called the sunshine dinner mm -hmm. yeah it's 1904 and it's uh, a group of mit alumni and they have this this dinner in new york and um <laughs> it's it's <laughs> it's there to honor william morton that's what they say they're doing they're honoring morton and they're honoring his treatment um, his treatment for cancer. But the night itself is rather bizarre. I mean, the, the tales of it is that they dark, the people dark in the room um, after dinner, I think, and there's glow-in-the-dark uh, paint everywhere, and there's glow-in-the-dark chickens and glow-in-the-dark eggs and glow-in-the-dark <laughs> skeletons. Mm -hmm. um, and even it said that uh, the, the founder of MIT, Skeleton, is in the corner, painted in this glow-in-the-dark <laughs> substance as well. And at the end of the evening, they all drink a shot of of uh, of a cocktail, essentially called liquid sunshine, which is in honour of Morton's treatment. And the idea is that it's been made it's water that's been made radioactive, but it also glows in the dark because they've put like a, a quinine right. in there. Mm -hmm. And so it glows in the dark, and everyone you can just imagine these 150 serious society men standing up and drinking a shot of this uh, this drink and for me that that really does sort of encapsulate the early years of radium it's serious medical treatment for cancer then suddenly you've got a dinner with glow in the dark dancing chickens and balloons and things <laughs> um, and then that in turn leads to the theatre which is again okay, something that actually blew my mind when I found out about it so the guy that designed this sunshine dinner Lester Gardner who goes on to have a very serious military career um, but in 1903 he's head of the entertainment committee for the MIT alumni group mm -hmm. and he comes up with this bizarre evening but then it turns out that he's also selling glow-in-the-dark paint so it's kind of that this entire evening has been designed by him to advertise this product that he then goes on to, to sell. And he sells it to a Broadway producer who's got this play um, on it, this, this musical on in broad, on Broadway. Um, and Gardner sells this glow-in-the-dark paint and an exclusive agreement to uh, F.C. Whitney, the, the producer. And this play itself is massive. It's I mean, it, it sounds like a rubbish play, but because they've got yeah. this glow-in-the-dark dancing uh, set, at the end of it, with these dancers who are the biggest, um, I mean, they're a group of vaudeville dancers who are really, really famous, but then because of the success of the play, which is only successful because of the glow-in-the-dark paint, they then go on to be the most successful group um, dancing act in the world, pretty much. They're earning $20,000 a year. and. They, that then allows them to sort of emancipate themselves from their management because they've been brought over from London. Um, basically, they didn't really want to come. They they sort of been sold by their families, you know, mm. their dance school. So you know, so we go from very quickly we go from cancer treatment to Broadway, 
and to, to, to these dancers. And I mean, that is it's quite a ride, that story. I, and it's I'm wondering, is this this show, this Broadway show, does that predate or post-date uh, Loie Fuller, who wanted radium? Um, right. That's a little bit difficult to actually say. I think um, I think Loie Fuller, from memory, um, debuts her performance first. Okay, but, but she think... couldn't get ready. Like Marie no. Curie had said, "Hey, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it's very hard to come by. This is very difficult." So uh, Loie Fuller, who is an experimental dancer, who um, is self-taught scientist herself, friends with Marie Curie friends with Pierre Curie, um, and friends with Thomas Edison, Edison as well. Yeah. <laughs> so she, she, I mean, Lois Fuller is known for her innovations in, in, in theatre, especially her experimentations with light. So she comes up with the idea that if you had coloured lights under the stage, it would uh, change change the mood of the theatre, that you could um, uh, uh, put them onto the, the costume, so you could have different colour costumes as you dance, you dance with mm -hmm. this. Um, but she's from <laughs> Edison and she goes to uh, Menlo Park, his, uh, his lab area, and learns how to um, experiment with phosphorescent salts that glow in the dark as well. So I think, I think Loewe Fuller doesn't actually have access to, to radium at the time. But it's the same principle that people are wanting to, to experiment with the substance. They're wanting to, to produce glow-in-the-dark materials because of the links with modernity and technology and the excitement around it. I mean, like I said, the Broadway show, uh, Piff Paff Poof, is not a very um, brilliant uh, show by all accounts. Yeah. This, the idea that there is a radium dance, that there's a, specially piece, a special piece of music called the radium dance, and that these performers are performing the radium dance whilst wearing radium glow-in-the-dark costumes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I kept waiting but we're not because Marie Curie is also friends with the Lowy Fuller who's doing another <laughs> radio dance at the same time it's it's all sort of uh, I'm doing the Lowy Fuller dance again but yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> well I kept waiting in the book really for the other shoe to drop when does everybody discover this was just such a bad idea <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it took a bit. I, I actually appreciated that, that you sort of, you know, you might have mentioned, okay, it's not good. We, we all in our collective knowledge these days know it's mm -hmm. not good to be hanging around a lot of radioactivity. But you took your time getting to the point of like talking mm -hmm. about the horrific things, including Edison's assistant who lost fingers, maybe even his lower arm, right? And Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think it's important. I think it's important to get to the point where right. people start realizing um, because there was no one point of, of realization. I mean, you start, I mean, almost as soon as radium was discovered, people started complaining that um, they were being damaged by it, they were being injured by it. So mm -hmm. that's one of the first reasons that it got in, it got used as medicine because uh, Henri Becquerel and Pierre Curie. Mm -hmm just to name two scientists who were playing around with radium in about 1901, started reporting that when they put the vials of the radium salts in their pocket, it would be burning through their clothes and actually damaging their skin. And one thing I wanted to get with this book is that they didn't go, oh, God, this is quite scary. They went, oh, hang on a minute, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and popped over to their friends in the hospital and suggested this as a treatment uh, for mm -hmm. skin disorders and, and external tumours. And so there was every single time almost that people got damaged or people got um, ill from using it, there was almost the idea that it was just because they hadn't quite worked out the dosage or the exposure mm -hmm. times. And if they just tinkered with it a little bit, they could control it. And it's sort of the substance that people felt that they were almost on the verge of being able to control it but just could never quite get there. And I think mm -hmm. that's quite an important way of thinking about radioactivity in general, even today. I mean, when you think about things like nuclear energy, people are always saying, well, we've almost, we've, all, we've worked it out now. It's fine. Those mistakes that were performed. <laughs> now, now we know they're there. Well, there's a very interesting question that that went with that, that, that was always behind what you were writing about. It's like, which came first in the beginning of the 20th century the excitement about a radium or the optimism that saw the positive. 
And when did everyone become disillusioned? And was it the pessimism that came after, I don't know, started in World War I, World War II really took it down and things that then caused people to look negatively at things? Or was there pessimism brought about because oh, the great promise of radium turned out to be it's killing everybody from the inside? It, it's yeah. a fascinating back and forth that the cultural st story really yeah. illuminates very well. And the, the, the science itself is, you, you know, you can't see radium in, in isolation either. I mean, there is a history of science, there's a history of optimism that wars do change, wars mm -hmm. destroy, um, First World War and Second World War, obviously. And then, I mean, the big real change is the atomic bomb. And it's something that, um, obviously, I do talk about it in, in Half-Lives, but... Um, then we're sort of shifting into the into uranium territory rather mm -hmm. than thinking specifically about radium, um, uranium and uh, plutonium territory. So I wanted to make sure that this book was fairly specifically about radium. So when I do talk about mm -hmm. the later periods, it's only in uh, in association with what what those changing attitudes made people feel mm -hmm. about radium. So there's a there's an example um, later in the book um, about the wind scale fire, the British nuclear um, accident mm -hmm. that happened in the late 1950s. And obviously that changes people's ideas about uh, nuclear energy and, and fears around that. But very specifically with radium, that then causes uh, the staff at the spa in the town of Bath um, in, in southwest of England, who had been working with radioactive waters for decades. So radium waters had become a, a medical mm -hmm. treatment, you know, fo following in the, tr uh, the tradition of uh, uh, spa treatments in general, in the early 1900s, it was discovered that water could become radioactive. So people started yes. going to these radium spas. And that's all fine and dandy until the late 50s, when the people who'd been working in the spa suddenly said, um, we're quite scared about the, the radioactivity in the water, can it be tested? And this is all because of wind scale. So, there's nothing to do with um, changes of attitudes in, in to do with radium in particular. It's when mm -hmm. it's when it becomes nuclear um, that people start feeling unsafe. So there's yeah. there's there's it's just there's no one point where people suddenly say uh, radium is scary. Right. Until you get a little bit later on in, in the history, and, and then everything is scary. You could you could track it pretty well through the whole book, the arc of. Uh, the first 30 years being of uh, companies selling patent medicines and, and such things going out of their way and spending all of their effort trying to convince people that, yes, there is actual radium in our product. It's there. It's rare. But we got some. You really, really, really get the real thing. And then the next 30 years seemed more starting to turn toward, yes, there's some radium, but it's a small amount that's not going to hurt you. It's just medicinal uh, so there is some radium, but there's radium in everything. Uh, the the attitudes track very very yeah. interesting with that. And it's not just that the, with the second period. It's not just that it's small amounts of radium is not going to hurt you. It is only we know how to control the radium. Mm. In our products are the best because we have the right type of radium. Okay. In the right amount that isn't going to hurt. That product's going to hurt you. This product's going to help you. So there's that tension there as well between sort right. of the good and the evil products, I think, as well. <laughs> yes. um, and it, it, yeah, it's I've, it's that just sort of tension at all times in the history of radium because nobody is really everyone's sort of feeling around and, and claiming that they're better than the others. And and I don't know. That's, yeah. that's, well, that always makes it fascinating, but that's also why it probably carries on much longer than you would think that the history yeah. of radium. There's always always a spin, right? And yeah. Yeah, you know, so, okay, my favorite part of the book, I liked it all, of course, but I really did enjoy the part about cosmetics and mm -hmm. spas, you know, like, like I, I, I wasn't even sure in the end what radium would actually do to your skin, but they were claiming it would remove pimples and remove wrinkles and oh you know we can get rid of some hair too because don't you good want way a, to kill a healthy follicles. a healthy glow a healthy glow exactly <laughs> and so yeah so um i'm not sure where to begin on that but i i think i'll let you take it away because it was so interesting and even famous names in 
you know, uh, cosmetics, makeup and all. And, and, and interestingly, that trend towards now, we want to show, you know, we have science on our side for mm -hmm. your beauty, for your age control, right? Things like that. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, um, I, I mean, the makeup was, as I said, where I, my starting point. But actually, as it turns out, I think the most interesting part of the story, and certainly the long, uh, the part of the story that has the, the longest history, because some of these products, this is where I show my show my products. Ah. Um, so this is, uh, there you go. This is a uh, Korean. Oh. Okay. Ooh, talk yeah. about in the book. So this is a bottle yes. of cranium. And this is a hair restorer. Mm -hmm. um, so it was sold by this lady called Helen Cavendish. Um, and she was a uh, Mayfair uh, salon owner. And Mayfair is the very exclusive posh part of, of London. Um, and this is at a time that when beauty salons were really the preserve of the really um, the upper class, the, the rich. And around about 1911, she sets starts this new uh, range of products, all made with radium. Um, and she's not even the first person. So, um, so I really sort of say that by 1903 is when radium becomes a consumer product, so when people start getting excited about it, 1903, 1904. But it is around about 1904, 1905 that cosmetic companies start producing uh, radioactive products or products that they say are radioactive because they mm -hmm. probably weren't at that period. Um, so it, radium uh, beauty companies are really the first consumer companies that leap on this new substance, um, which really and the beauty the beauty industry at this point is not really that well formed. So um, mm -hmm. it's you've got these big companies that mostly do toiletries like toothpastes and and and, uh, and creams, but the beauty industry, you know, the industry that's aimed specifically at uh, women and to uh, improve the condition of their skin, get rid of wrinkles, is really uh, a new industry at this point. And radium is one of the first uh, ingredients that they leap onto and start saying, well, this this is us, essentially. So they're saying that uh, they're uh, an industry of science, of technology, of modernity. And radium is a really useful um, substance for that. Now, radium and... Uh, this product, it's really difficult to show bottles, but I'm just waving. Yes. <laughs> this is uh, Renair. So this is Renair, Renair. Um, radioactive antiseptic hair tonic. And these are both waters. So they are waters with added radium. And it's not really clear how they add the radium. But the idea is that uh, this, this substance um, stimulate your metabolism. So if you, uh, you're meant to put these on your head, the, I've got other ones that you're meant to drink that do the same thing, but it stimulates your metabolism. And the idea is that it sort of, in these cases, it stimulates your follicles, your hair follicles, or it rejuvenates your skin cells. Um, <laughs> so the idea is that these ones in particular are gonna get rid of any dandruff. They're gonna improve the condition of your hair. Um, radium, Actually, both of them say that they're actually going to change the your hair color as well. So, mm -hmm. if you use these, they're going to restore your natural hair color. So, they're going to get rid of grays. Um, Brenner also uh, will improve uh, any baldness as well. So, if you use this, you're going to grow new hair. So, it's going to improve the hair you've got, and you're going to grow new hair as well. <laughs> and it's all through this idea that they're stimulating the metabolism. Um, and this is a, uh, there's a theory behind it and it's called mild radium therapy. So radium therapy is using salts to burn off skin disorders or tumors, mm -hmm. or if you insert them into the body to uh, burn internal tumors, mild radium therapy is a little bit of radium. So it's usually in the form of radon gas or uh, water that's been infused with radium. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is mild radium therapy. So this is the spas, and then from the spas, the so places like uh, Bath and Buxton in Britain, uh, Saratoga Springs in New York, mm -hmm. uh, maybe else? Hot Springs, the Arkansas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so places like that. Um, so then that starts coming into. So you've got your. You can go to these places for spa treatments, or you can buy these types of products in any uh, any shop. I mean. Caradium, as I said, was on sale um, in Helen Cavendish's uh, exclusive Mayfair salon, but soon she starts selling it in 
Uh, there's a big uh, company here called Boots, the chemist, mm -hmm. which yeah. has hundreds of, um, hundreds of branches. It's on sale there. It's on These products are on sale in Harrods and Selfridges, you know, mm -hmm. these massive, uh, massive uh, stores here. So, you know, they're, they're, these aren't things that are, you don't, these aren't under the counter products that people mm -hmm. are going to buy. These are, I'm going to march into Harrods Gentleman's uh, Hair Salon and purchase my radium hair tonic that's going to improve my, my hair. Uh, um, I'd love to see the, um, product reviews <laughs> you know people you know expressing whether their hair really grew back in their original color mm -hmm. or well i mean plenty of these adverts have testimonials but how far you can trust testimonials but i you know one of the things i think about with these products is caradium i'll show you again mm -hmm. was on sale for about 50 years um, and i'm going with the idea that if something is on sale for that long somebody likes it somewhere yeah. Um, and it does go on its own journey. So from the Mayfair Salon to being available in the top shops, by about 1955, Helen Cavendish seems to be long dead or long no, no longer associated mm. with, the, with the organization. But by the 50s, it's mail order in the back of a newspaper. Mm. So it is a little bit more, um, not as prestigious then. But again, it's on sale for 50 years. Um, so when mm. they say in their adverts that they have uh, long satisfied customers, you kind of think, well, this product is doing something for them. It might not be the radioactivity, but the, the luxuriousness of the product. Um, and unfortunately, all I have is empty bottles, so I don't yeah, even sure. that. But the luxuriousness of the product, the smell, um, maybe that was something. I don't think it was the radioactivity, but the product mm. itself must have been of good quality. Mm -hmm. I saved a... Uh... A quotation uh, speaking speaking as the guy here who at this point may be wondering and i think i did when i read like the flyleaf cover before i started the book is like really what has cosmetics got to do with the history of radium uh and why is it part of the story and we've been talking about these little landmarks and things but uh here's one where um you say Early on, you say Gordon Selfridge placed cosmetics on open display, which raised a few eyebrows in 1910. Following this, by the mid 20s, in both the US and Western Europe, there were thousands of retail outlets where beauty products could be purchased. Cosmetics were no longer relegated to under the counter, slightly shameful purposes, but were instead openly embraced by the modern woman. So you didn't have to be a tart anymore. It was a major growth industry. <laughs> it collided with this whole thing of radium as a miracle thing and so it's a, a major growth industry we know how huge an industry it is now this is this is the explanation or a reason why it's so entwined with this history of radium at the same time right yeah i mean the companies i um i talked specifically about um helena rubenstein, rubenstein mm -hmm. who yeah. is uh, a a giant in, in cosmetics and beauty history. Now, she doesn't specifically use, as far as I've been able to find, radium as a product. But what she does talk about a lot is scientific advancement. And mm -hmm. she's in early publicity photos, she is always um, shown wearing a white lab coat. Mm -hmm. uh, she refers to her customers as uh, patients. So people who come into her beauty salons mm -hmm. are patients, and they're coming to her um, operating rooms, they're coming to her rooms. <laughs> Um, and she really is the person, I mean, she's incredibly clever, and she is one of the people that turns the beauty industry from a slightly quacky, quacky mm -hmm. uh, under-the-counter industry to what we know of it today. And she does it by using these techniques. So she talks about scientific advancement. These products are, in all the, the adverts, they say we... Um, we recognize that rate um, we identify that radium is a scientific advancement you know this is why our products work we are uh, using the latest science we are using the latest technology mm -hmm. and that is i mean it's not just radium but radium is one of the vehicles that moves the beauty industry into, mm -hmm. into this, this serious um serious business and it's all industry. it's all modern it's all scientific it's hygienic mm -hmm. And those were the those were the things driving all the fashions at the time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's why radium, again, that's why I'm so interested in it because of my background in the history of cosmetics. 
But, you know, you can't talk about cosmetics in this period without thinking about science, without thinking about medicine mm -hmm. and the debt that that industry owes to those uh, to those industries and how they're all intertwined as well. I mean, uh, Helena Rubenstein um, spoke with, uh, was Polish, as was Marie Curie. And they, um, <laughs> at one point they, they met and uh, Rubenstein was like, um, she started talking about what Marie Curie cooked up in her kitchen. <laughs> that's what she would do. She would cook up her beauty mm -hmm. treatments in, in the thing she called a kitchen. So there's a link between kitchens and science and, oh, I mean, yeah. It, but but yeah, that interesting link of women were in the kitchen, but now it's yeah, yeah, interesting. I like that. I I really I mean I was really super fascinated by that, and of course my mind went to things like, well, what do we have nowadays? You know, people some products have stem cells, plant stem cells. I don't imagine they have real stem cells because we have some more regulation now. But uh, the, yeah. the, I guess the surprising lack of regulation. Well, there is, and an, I mean, when you think about, when I talk about the downfall of, of radium as a consumer product, mm -hmm. that really can be linked to regulations of the beauty industry. So there are regulations that stop people using radium internally, um, and it stops being recommended as, as uh, medical treatments in the, in the early 30s. But it's not until the late 30s that uh, the American government, I mean, I'm specifically talking about America here, because um, it's different in, in different countries, uh, the American government starts cracking down on products that are not well controlled, so whether it's food or cosmetics. Um, and um, it's uh, 1938 that the FDA's, uh, there's a new, uh, oh, called the Beauty Act, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember what it's called now, Food, Cosmetics and Drug Act. Um, in 1938, and that is the one that sort of says, we know that there's some terrible stuff in beauty products, mm -hmm. including radium. This is what we're going to do to crack down on it. And it's things like, uh, we were talk um, talking about giants of the beauty. So this is Elizabeth Arden. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so this is something called um, skin food. And in 1938, Elizabeth Arden was stopped from producing or calling this product skin food because um, the FDA was saying, well, there's no evidence that it feeds the skin. Um, so it's things like that that starts. Um, so it's not just the ingredients and it's not just whether things are safe or not, but it's the the way of talking about them as well. I mean, skin mm -hmm. food just sounds so delicious, doesn't it? <laughs> it's yes. nourishing before you even put, on, uh, put it on. And these radium cosmetics, they're going to make your skin glow. They're going to feed your skin. It, it just feels feels like they're doing something um, as well. You can <laughs> like, feel it working when you put it yeah, on, it tingles. Right. Even just having it next to me, I can feel it working. But, they, <laughs> uh, but you know, now we do, we're still doing the same things now. We're still oh, sure. using the same language. We're still using products that probably shouldn't be in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But nobody, nobody has the time to pay attention to them. I mean, no one's reading every ingredient. We know that some, we know that cosmetic companies um, we'll say something is dermatologically safe to use as being tested, but that doesn't mean that it's safe to use. It just means it's not damaging the external mm -hmm. uh, substance of your skin. We could be doing anything inside, but <laughs> it's the same. So it's the same sort of thing. We, we haven't learned our lessons particularly. We're still using these products, um, and one of the going back to why I wanted to write this book was. I really, I mean, this is about a decade ago, and you used to, there was uh, lots of lists about 10 things that we used to do to ourselves before mm -hmm. we knew better. Yes. And radium always comes up on that list. There was radium suppositories, radium condoms. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, there was radium condoms. I have some. They did not contain radium. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, thank sure. goodness. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a brand name. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> But yeah, so there was always this list about, you know, 10 things we our grandparents used to do that will blow your mind. Yeah. And I just thought, well, we're still doing those. What is that? What's that list going to look like in 30 years time? And in the meantime, I'm going to write a book that sort of explains that they weren't just being stupid. They were responding to science they were responding to wider culture. This was part of something. This wasn't just people making a fast buck. This mm -hmm. was people thinking, well, it's worked here, might work here, let's go for it. And um, I was trying to get the nuance of that story. 
Yeah. It's a so, it's a very important story. I think of I think of that it's like young people. It's like how could our grandparents have thought eating white bread was a good idea? And the answer is that it was embedded in a whole culture in which it was the best idea. Yeah. And you have you have given us a very good view of how all of this made sense, even though it looks horrifying or incomprehensible looking back. But at the time, it was part of all these um, currents to the extent that. It's, it's, it's hard to say. I, I keep finding myself asking the questions like, oh, so in the early 30s, um, you had the British Medical Associations and things and this new committee that started regulating radium. It's like, well, was it the regulating radium that started making people's attitudes change? Or was it because people's attitudes were changing that they finally started regulating radium? And boy, you can't you can't really say, can you? Uh, mm -hmm. they, they just all it all is a huge thing that moves along together. Yeah, there's, interesting there's, no one point, there's no one study, there's no one example of that changes anything. It's just a, a really, this has, makes the sound book terrible, it's just this really long drawn out history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's fascinating, obviously. Um, that just, I mean, I, even now I don't really know the point to when people stopped because there's still discussions. I mean, I, I saw one on uh, Instagram this morning. Uh, someone tagged me into it, that there was a discussion about radium products, um, specifically going to radi uh, 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 radions, uh, oh, what are they called? Uh, in America, where you go and breathe the radon mine, in the mm -hmm. mine, so you go re breathe in the radon gas. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, my God, people still do that. Yes, they do. And um, it's a lot, has a long history. And, and in uh, Central Europe as well, Tons of towns um, are still built on this aspect that you can go there and get a radium mm -hmm. treatment. Um, I went to a couple um, in the days where you could just pop across and um, travel. Um, I would <laughs> yeah. go and I went to Czech Republic and um, went to the oldest radon spa in the world, which was established wow. in 1909. Um, and I went to the, the hotel that was built in 1911 um, and went and had a, a radium bath. And people there swear by it. Um, I went to a town in Austria, again, another a town where pretty much the whole town is set up for people to come and have these radium treatments. Um, people people come back every year. People just um, really do depend on them. Um, and I make no judgment about whether that's, mm -hmm. you know, scientifically correct or whether it's um, medically uh, a good idea. But for them, it works, and for them, they believe in it. Um, wow. And you know, and, and enough people do it to make it a whole industry. So it's it's a lot. And of another one from me for people who are wondering: it's like, am I going to like this book, or am I going to find it irritating? Was in the epilogue where you mentioned that you purposely set out, and your intent was not to do a judgmental history, mm -hmm. um, but just to record what people were doing and how they were responding, what their attitudes were, and and that worked out very well. Uh, so it, 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 um, not for them necessarily. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, that's but true. It, it worked out very well. And it's like, you didn't even need to make the judgments that would just be preachy, mm -hmm. but all of these things are here. And you, and it is, as you're saying now, it's very hard to sort out what, what, you know, it's like, how could our grandparents have done this? Mm -hmm. Well, for reasons that you can't even understand because it was a different time and a different place. Yeah. Yep. But if well, we learn about the history. Our grandkids will say the same thing. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll be like, yeah. wow, really? You did that. <laughs> so why yeah. are you, why do you have all that bisphenol A in yeah. your yeah. plastic? Yeah, there's so many examples. I mean, we can think of every, you know, every single day of our lives we're surrounded by stuff that could could be the the mm -hmm. someone writing a book about it in 30 years or i mean smoking is something i keep oh, thinking for sure. about a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah you know, people are absolutely gobsmacked that you could go to a restaurant and have people were smoking next to you it seems yeah absolutely yeah. strange I, I remember it and it seems strange um, yes yeah. or on an airplane you yeah. know we, we were flying across the ocean when i was 11 and everyone could smoke <laughs> my dad included yes. so yes yeah, you've got, you've got the, the little curtain between the smoking section and the non-smoking section. So it's yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's so many things, and so I, I'm, I'm glad people are identifying that that I didn't want to be judgmental because it is so yeah. tempting mm -hmm. to be judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, and some of, and it is a fine line because some of the stuff is quite um, 
quite wacky, really. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I'll show you another little thing from my collection, <laughs> which is something I talk about as well. So these are, uh, try not to drop them because I'm quite Oh, old. yes. <laughs> oh. So these are, um, so you think you see the pictures here. So this is a radon bowl, and it's made by a company called Sparklets. And it yeah. goes in this. <laughs> which is uh, a sparklet <gasps> soda siphon. And the idea is that you put the bulb in here, press down on this, mm -hmm. and out of here, because you've filled this up with water, and out of here comes uh, carbonated sparkling water, um, which was a thing for this company. They'd already been selling for about 20 years the means to make water sparkling, but this was new for them. So the idea that you could also make your water radioactive Yes. Um, and it would be healthy um, and it would be something that you could do every day because um, these, I can't remember how much they are, as he says, but um, they weren't that expensive. They're available everywhere. You could take them back to be refilled. Um, so the idea was that every meal you could have the sparkling water or you could um, mix it in with your whiskey and have sparkling whiskey <laughs> soda. And it, it's tempting to go, oh, no, no that's just so... <laughs> <laughs> so wacky <laughs> that it's tempting to be judgmental with things like this but again you know this is this has already got a long history they've just updated their their technology they've updated their product responded to the market and given the consumers what they want and at the point they want radium they want to be able to have this healthy water mm -hmm. and they want to be able to have it on a daily basis so it's when you put it in the context of that, and also they would be reading newspapers that would say if you go to Bath or Buxton or Saratoga or, or Hot Springs, Arkansas, you're going to go and be able to drink healthy water. Yeah. So bring it home, you know. <laughs> Continue your treatment. Continue your treatment, yeah. Um, do you ever feel like uh, at some point you want to own a Geiger counter? <laughs> No, deliberately <laughs> not. Um, I, very few of my stuff is actually, uh, the, the spot bulbs are radioactive. Um, most of the stuff I have is either empty um, or um, was possibly radon. So radon has a half-life of like three days. So that's okay. that's long gone. Um, I don't think there's anything in my collection that's particularly dangerous. Um, one of the frustrations, but also one of the safe things is you can't get that much in Britain anymore. A lot seems to have been destroyed. Um, if I went over to America, I know that I could uh, get tons of really, really hot stuff that would be really <laughs> dangerous to have. Mm -hmm. but we don't, I mean, here we had almost as much on sale, but it doesn't seem to have survived. I mean, there was a, a concerted effort in the 60s to destroy everything. Um, seems to be a bit more successful here because... I mean, I've been collecting for a decade and you don't find that much really radioactive stuff. Museums certainly destroyed most of their collections mm -hmm. um, about 15 years ago, I think. Right. Really? Wow. Yeah. Destroyed. I mean, I know, uh, like the Science Museum in London has a few has a few bits and pieces, but I know that they got rid of a lot of their consumer products. They keep the scientific equipment. They keep the serious stuff. Mm -hmm. but things like the, the the blankets that um, had radioactive rubble in them were just destroyed for being too dangerous, um, which is a shame. But um, yeah. probably the best. But there's still there's still you know evidence, images, advertising. Yeah, it's why it's why your history of documenting all of this is so vital. Right. Yeah, there was the, I did get one review a while ago saying that book talks a lot about radium. Well, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it, I want it. Yes. I, at some point, it was almost going to be a catalog of stuff because nobody's document. Nobody's really documenting in America. Again, people have documented, but the British uh, side of things, nobody's really documented all of the different products. And I, I didn't have a vehicle for doing that. Um, mm -hmm. The book would have been very dull if it was just a, just a list. And I tried well, to yes. put stories no. in. No, the um, stories are I, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there's a. These people who were doing this stuff were quite interesting, it turns out. You know, if you if you set up a radium company in 1920, you've got a bit of a story behind you, as it turns yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, and to find out how, it's hard to do this without sounding double entendre, you know, how penetrating radium was, that how it how it became such a part of so much, how, 
how deeply cultural it was. Yeah. Uh, the, these days, you don't discover a new element and have everybody talking about it on the streets of New York. And that's a phrase now, but it's like, there was a time when everybody talked about radium at their dinner parties because they had they had sparklets in their yeah. whiskey and soda. Yeah, and radium clearly had a good PR person, you know. It's, yeah. It was, it was, you could, uh, I think you could sit at a dinner table and you could have your radium water and you could have your irradiated food because radium is um, is a, a going to kill bacteria as well. So there's a mm -hmm. whole thing about killing the bacteria in your food. So you could have radioactive food as well. And, and yeah. you could talk about the only woman who's ever won a physics and chemistry and Nobel Prize, right. or the only person who's yeah. ever won a physics and chemistry Nobel Prize. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't. I didn't talk huge about the about Marie Curie in the book because there's so many books about her. Yes, but you sure. can't tell the story without her. I mean, and she is she is intimately involved in some of these products. I mean, I don't talk about it in the book um, because I'm specifically looking at Britain and America, really. But um, people in the Curie family actually have, actually take legal advice against some of these companies, especially the ones that are using the Curie name. So mm -hmm. going back to this product, um, this is 1933 in France, so this is launched in Paris, and um, their big selling point is it's a formula to uh, des designed by uh, Dr. Alfred Curie. So they're using the name Curie mm. to, to give an indication that their product is, is safe or it's really radioactive, whatever they want to do with it. And um, But the Curie family, the real Curie family, because Alfred Curie is a real person, he is a real doctor, but he's not a doctor of radioactivity and he's mm. not anything to do with the Curies. So the Curie family get really fed up and take legal advice. What can we do? Mm. And the answer is nothing because this guy is genuinely Dr. Curie. Curie. Right. So this so so radio, um, they drop the name Alfred Curie um when France makes it illegal to have radium in your products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But until that point, they're going around and saying, this is to the formula of Dr. Curie, it contains radium, it's going to help you, it's going to make you beautiful. It's us using science to uh, pre uh, present, pre prevent your aging and to make you radiant, because uh, it's, a, it's a face powder, but it's also uh, lipsticks and creams and all sorts of things, all under this name Curie. Um, so again, so Marie Curie's still there she's still linked into it she does not like these products being used with her name towards the end of her life she starts being quite nervous about the the, the range of products that are available um, mm -hmm. that have no doctors involved in them you can just send off for them and get some really strong radioactive salts that you uh, take unsupervised and she clearly gets nervous about that so there's a change of attitude from her as well yeah, I, I can imagine. And of course, uh, a story that has been told quite often are the about the, the watch painters, mm -hmm. the, the gals who do that. And um, and I was like, yeah, just thinking about how useful that actually was. That was actually something very useful. There's no, you know, we think it's helping your skin look beautiful or your hair grow back. It really is an absolutely essential thing to have this yeah. glowing watch dial in the dark so your enemy doesn't see you because ah well this this is a more so this is more modern so the watches start coming uh very popular in the first world war because being able to see the time in the in the dark without striking a match for instance yes. is incredibly useful in trench warfare you do not want to have a uh, show where you are to the enemy so having something that glows very lightly on your on your wrist is is amazing and uh, radium watches are considered to be one of the most important uh, pieces of kit for for an officer in uh, for, in the first world war i mean there's there's uh, officer handbooks that say uh, radium watch gun <laughs> Mm -hmm. but, not, but radium watch is up there. I think it is higher than gun most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important. But by the 20s, which is when this comes in, it's not only uh, useful for warfare, it's also fashionable for the, for the modern woman. Mm -hmm. So you can have your glow-in-the-dark watch and probably go to your beauty salon and get your uh, radium 
face mask <laughs> and then come out and put your radium powder on and your radium lipstick a little bit later but <laughs> radium eye beautifier or anything like that I mean, you can you can cover yourself from head to foot radium which is why it's not really surprising when you read about the radium girls the the people who actually painted these watches mm -hmm not being too concerned about surrounding themselves with radium paint. Mm -hmm. right. They were encouraged to point the, their paintbrushes to get a smooth painting uh, mm -hmm. line on, on the dials. Why would they worry when you could open the, any magazine, you could open Vogue and see hundreds of adverts for these products. Why would they be worried? But the story with them is they weren't worried, but their immediate um, supervisors, mm. people um, in the science bit of the, the paint factory, were worried enough to uh, put in uh, precautions for themselves, but didn't worry enough to put precautions in for the people who were licking the, licking mm. the paint. Yeah. So there's that story as well, all there. But you can't tell that story without really thinking about why no. there was such right. demand for these products. Well, yeah. the, the interesting story, because the we're all familiar now with illuminated dials and things, and that being one of the, the few um, faddish fashions that survived as something that was seen yeah. as useful. And that was coupled with the Radium Girls, which was a very high profile, Radium can be bad, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the early things that drew attention to that mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and it's a fairly horrifying story um, that it companies... Companies then just went on and did whatever they wanted, but it's like, well, we've made some regulations and things now. But, but that was that was quite a story, wasn't it? That was very commonly known then at the time. It was, and it was um, one of the things that I didn't realize before. There was actually a film in 1937 starring Carol Lombard, and mm. in that film, she is um, she works in a radium factory, and she gets diagnosed as having radiation poisoning, and she's told that she is going to die. And this is, you know, like A-list uh, Hollywood star film. Uh, it's a comedy. Um, oh. <laughs> um, I haven't seen it, so it's not Silkwood. <laughs> no, so she, yeah, she's a comedy. So she she gets told um, she gets told by her local doctor that she's got radiation poisoning. She's going to die, and then she becomes uh, known by the New York Post or New York Times or something like that. Um, and they bring her across to to New York. Um, to live the life before she dies. Um, and then it all goes a bit screwball from there. But yeah, this is, so the Radium Girls are high profile, they're in every newspaper, but there's also a, a Hollywood film. This is not about them, but about, about what's happened to them. So you, people would have to know enough about that story to really understand the film for a start. So, you know, there's there's also a film with Marlena Dietrich and Carrie Grant a few years earlier about radiation poisoning in commercial chemists and industrial chemists mm. who work with radium for a living. So there mm -hmm. are these high profile films. People know that radium is dangerous. And this is in mm -hmm. the late, this is in the 30s, but people knew. Um, and there was plenty of evidence out there as well. Mm -hmm. Starting that way. So, well, we're coming to the end of an hour. Lucy, is there anything we didn't bring up that you might like to say? Oh, there's so much, right? There's so much. It's, it's, a, in the book. it's a huge story. <laughs> um, I think, I guess, the only thing really is that I said earlier that there was not that much um, cataloging out there apart from in America. So I've started cataloging um, my collection um, on something that I call the Museum of Radium. So if people were interested in seeing all the stuff I've been waving at the camera, I've put that on that website and I'm adding not the, not the content of the book, but adding the um, some extracts, but adding the information there. So we are logging this information. I'm also getting the products tested at a university so we can actually have evidence of, of what they were. And some of their testing might be able to um, scrape something out from a from an empty package. So we're hoping there that we're just just adding to the story. You know, um, mm -hmm. there's still yeah. a lot we don't know. So mm -hmm. it's a, is it a virtual museum or is it will be a physical location? It's a virtual museum. It's all on my website, um, the Museum of Radium Co.uk. Um, I've also got an exhibition, a virtual exhibition up there about uh, radium in LA as well. So I'm doing oh. temporary uh, virtual exhibitions to when the story's a bit bigger um, and stuff that hasn't fitted into the mm -hmm. book. As well. That's good. And and, and the, if you do pick up her physical book, you do have some interior pages with some from your collection. Yeah. Right. 
and yeah, yeah. I like lots of don't they? So, so this is this is a project with both, shall we say, popular and scholarly intent, uh, yes. and both are important. Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to make it more than just here's some pretty stuff. Isn't the history mm -hmm. behind it interesting? Mm -hmm. I wanted to add to the to the specific um, academicness behind the topic as well. Um, it's obviously a topic that people have done a lot of work on. But I just hoped that I could add a little bit extra to that. No, well, that's great, and yeah. Absolutely, I saw I saw on uh, Twitter. So your your museum actually exists, so people can follow <laughs> on follow on Twitter as well. Muse is what's your handle there? Uh, it's Museum of R A. R A. Okay. <laughs> All right. If it was more slick, I'd know it, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think it's here. Museum of R A. Yeah, Museum of Radium. Very yeah, good. Museum of R, capital R, capital A. Well, yeah. If anyone finds me, Lucy Jane Santos underscore yeah. on Twitter, they'll find me talking about mm. radio at some point. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Lucy has written the book, um, Half Lives The Unlikely History of Radium, and there's different covers floating around out there. I, I saw you, you showed yours, but there's also one with an I. Yeah, there's the hardback. Um, the British hardback has a has an eye. Uh, this is the British paperback. Paperback and yeah, and so the US just hardback. has the hardback for now. Yeah, yeah. So. I think it's also uh, there's an audio book of it as well. And yes, in the US yes. as well. Well, everybody, please check out Lucy's book. This is your first book. Got plans for more? There will be one on uranium coming up. Oh no, ah, kidding! Good. Oh, wonderful! I I, I will read that. <laughs> <laughs> I already find it fascinating anyway. So thank you everybody for joining us, especially our guest Lucy, and we'll see you again sometime soon on Read Science. Thank you.